Hello, and welcome to the Serial Talker podcast. I'm Peter Von Gom. In today's podcast, we're going to revisit one of the much forgotten crimes of the late 1960s against one of the most iconic artists of the 20th century, the shooting of the King of Pop. <laughs> oh! Not that guy, Andy Warhol. Rightfully, Warhol should be remembered and credited for his enormous contribution to pop art and the bohemian cultural movement that continues to this day. But what has often slipped under the psychedelic shag carpet of the Manhattan scene he was hosting is that he nearly lost his life at the hands of an assassin, lest you forget. On a muggy June 3rd, 1968, a disgruntled female acquaintance of Andy Warhol, Valerie Solanas, armed with two small caliber pistols and a bazooka-sized grudge, entered Warhol's infamous factory located in the Decker Building on Manhattan's East 16th Street and made her way to the sixth floor studio. There, she confronted Warhol and art critic Mario Amaya and fired on them multiple times, striking each once. Amaya in the hip and Warhol once in the abdomen with devastating destruction on multiple organs in his body. What made her so furious towards Warhol that she attempted to murder him and others? It's a long and sordid affair that first requires an introduction to the main star, his influence on the world of art, the factory, and the posse of very interesting characters that he surrounded himself with. Andy Warhol was most known for his influential and sometimes controversial popism artwork. Born and raised in Pittsburgh, he initially pursued a successful career as a commercial illustrator. After exhibiting his work in several galleries in the late 1950s, he began to receive recognition as an influential and controversial pop artist. Pop turned traditional art upside down, Taking images from advertising, comic books, and other bits of popular culture, the pop in pop art. Campbell's soup can silkscreens ladled him with fame, becoming artistic beacons gazing at life's banal objects with a wan, repertorial eye. Campbell's was something that he ate every day for 20 years. When Warhol's soup show opened in 1962, pop was just getting started. People had no idea what to make of art that was so different from everything that art was supposed to be. Warhol fit that impression to a T. His fame and eccentric place in art history was quickly cemented. Today, his original artworks include some of the most expensive paintings ever sold and continue to serve as a bellwether for the art market. One of Warhol's early paintings, the diptych Silver Car Crash, sold for $105.4 million in 2013. His New York studio, The Factory, became a well-known gathering place that brought together distinguished intellectuals, drag queens, playwrights, bohemian street people, Hollywood celebrities, porn stars, wealthy patrons, and openly gay celebrities. Warhol himself lived openly as a gay man well before the gay liberation movement and was largely considered asexual by many of his partners over the years. Many of the factory regulars became part of a clique of personalities known as Warhol superstars. They appeared in Warhol's artworks and accompanied him in his social life, epitomizing his famous dictum, in the future everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. Warhol would simply film them and declare them superstars. Lou Reed's biggest hit, Walk on the Wild Side, is about this group of eccentrics. Viva, Ultraviolet, International Velvet, Ingrid Superstar, and Candy Darling, to name just a few. Warhol's superstars played games of lust, perversion, drug addiction, and brutality before his crotchety cameras. And they did it with pizzazz. The superstars would help Warhol generate publicity, while Warhol offered fame and attention in return. Warhol's factory was the hip New York City hangout for artistic types and amphetamine users. It was completely covered in silver, 
Fractured mirrors and tinfoil were the basic decorating materials, and the New York City speed freaks of the 60s loved it. Any given night, you might rub shoulders with such legends as Bob Dylan, Mick Jagger, Salvador Dali, and Truman Capote. Filmmaker Paul Morrissey was often accompanying Warhol at the factory as a close friend and confidant, his fame most certainly influenced by being one of the superstars. Some of the more notable events at the factory included fake weddings between drag queens, porn film rentals, and vulgar plays. But besides it being a one-stop shop of who's who party places and somewhere for Warhol's friends to crash, it really was a factory. By the time Warhol had achieved a reputation, he was working day and night on his paintings. Warhol used silk screens so that he could mass-produce images the way corporations mass-produced consumer goods, and he did it in the factory. To increase production, the Warhol superstars helped him and contributed greatly to the atmosphere for which the factory became legendary. Warhol also dipped his big toe into movie making, experimental movie making, such as Chelsea Girls, considered his most successful film, earning nearly $500,000 at the time, a significant sum for an alternative movie released in the late 1960s. Warhol lifted the underground cinema's popularity to new heights while sinking the contents to sadistic depths. For years, Warhol celebrated every form of licentiousness. The king of pop was the blonde guru of a nightmare world, photographing depravity and calling it truth. One regular at the factory was an actress who played a lesbian in one of Warhol's films, I, a Man. Her name was Valerie Solanas, and in a schizophrenic rage, she shot and nearly killed the king of pop. Valerie Solanas had a turbulent childhood in a broken home. After a volatile relationship with her mother and stepfather, she moved away to live with her grandparents. This also was far from ideal, and eventually, after achieving a degree in psychology, settled on the West Coast in Berkeley and began working as a writer. It was here that she became a women's rights activist and helped push feminism to radical new heights. It's also where she began penning her self-published Scum Manifesto, released in 1967. Scum, the Society for Cutting Up Men. When she founded Scum, she was its only member. The manifesto begins, Life in this society being at best an utter bore, and no aspect of society being at all relevant to women, there remains to civic-minded, responsible, thrill-seeking females only to overthrow the government, eliminate the money system, institute complete automation, and eliminate the male sex. Hmm. Okay, we have a bit to unpack here. So, aside from the thrill-seeking army of chicks overthrowing the government, the elimination of the money system, well, I'm a big fan of Bitcoin, and complete automation, she was also onto something here. The Internet of Things, autonomous vehicles, she was a futurist. It's the complete annihilation of the male sex that I'm having a problem with. Even Lorena Bobbitt stopped a snip short of that. She eventually made her way to New York City and got infused with the art scene there. She supported herself through begging and prostitution and continued to write. It was her play, Up Your Ass, that played center stage in the true-life attempted murder of Andy Warhol that was soon to take place. It was her play, Up Your Ass, that played center stage in the true-life attempted murder of Andy Warhol, a scene that was soon to take place. The play is about a young prostitute who is a man-hating hustler and panhandler, and who ends up killing a man. Valerie Solanas first crossed paths with Warhol in 1965 and became an occasional attendee of factory bashes, mixing in with the bohemian scene, the fashionistas, and, of course, Warhol's superstars. Thinking perhaps Warhol's connections and fame could help her with scum ambitions, she wrote a letter to Warhol and tried to get him to help promote scum, asking him if he'd like to join the Men's Auxiliary, 
the group of sympathetic men who were, according to the manifesto, working diligently to eliminate themselves. Not surprisingly, it went nowhere. Meanwhile, Solanus continued to struggle finding steady work and providing for herself via an unsavory lifestyle. Fast forward to 1967. One day outside the factory, Solanus passed her neatly typed play on to a bewildered but gracious Warhol. Complimenting her on her typing skills, he promised to read it and get back to her. He passed, after skimming the satirical and highly scatological script, he found it so obscene that he suspected Solanus was working with the police on some kind of entrapment. You see, Warhol, whose films were often shut down by the police for obscenity, thought the script was too pornographic. It had to be a trap. The play was considered vulgar and humorless. Even Andy and his risque crew thought it was a bit too much. A couple of weeks later, Solanus contacted Warhol about the script and was told that he had lost it. She was infuriated. He then jokingly offered her a job at the factory as a typist. Insulted, Solanus demanded money for the lost manuscript. Warhol had never promised to produce the play, but he gave the perpetually broke Solanus instead $25 to appear as a lesbian character in his film I, a Man. Solanus was satisfied with her experience working with Warhol and her performance in the film and brought a publisher she was courting to see the film. Solanus continued her pursuit of a producer for her play. Despite Warhol's rejection, she remained steadfast, hitting up several figures in theater she knew and pitching it to them. She was growing increasingly agitated and desperate as the answer she got from all was a resounding no. On May 31, 1968, Solanus stopped by a writer acquaintance's studio for a chat. The topic of the play naturally was brought up, roadblock after roadblock. Finding a willing partner was becoming fruitless. Frazzled at being rejected yet again, she asked him if she could borrow $50 and left. That night, she headed to Times Square, where she knew she could acquire what she needed. A firearm, her second. She kept a 22 caliber pistol with her for protection when she was meeting with Johns on her Lady of the Night shifts, but she wanted something a little more, something that could really let people know she meant business. She exchanged the money in an alley for a 32 Beretta, classic, Italian-made, a small concealable semi-automatic pistol, filled to capacity with ammunition, small yet deadly powerful. Eight bullets would be plenty for her mission statement. It was the morning of June 3rd, 1968, and for nearly four hours, Solanus pestered producer Margot Faden at her residence, trying to convince her to produce the play and discussing her vision for a world without men. Faden repeatedly refused to produce the play, an angry and frustrated Solanus then pulled out a gun from her bag brandishing it like a trophy, telling Faden, yes, you will produce the play because I'll shoot Andy Warhol and that will make me famous and the play famous and then you'll produce it. As she stood up to leave, Solanus handed Faden a copy of the now notorious play and other personal papers. After Solanus left, Faden immediately called her local police precinct, Andy Warhol's precinct, police headquarters in Lower Manhattan, and the offices of Mayor John Lindsay and Governor Nelson Rockefeller, reporting what happened and informing them that the unstable Solanus was on her way to murder Andy Warhol. Whether or not the police took note of the threat remains unclear. It was noon, and Solanus made her way to the factory. It was closed, and nobody answered her calls. She waited outside. Later, film director Morrissey arrived and asked what she was doing there. She replied she was waiting for Andy to arrive, to get her money. Morrissey tried to get rid of her, telling her Warhol wasn't coming in that day. She said she'd wait. At around 2 p.m., a tousled Solanus went up to the sixth floor and into the studio. 
Morrissey told her again that Warhol wasn't coming in and that she had to leave. She left and parked herself in the elevator and rode it up and down until Warhol finally boarded it with art critic Mario Amaya. She entered the factory with Warhol and Amaya, Warhol turning to her and complimenting her on her appearance. The staunch feminist was uncharacteristically wearing makeup. Morrissey, fed up with the incessantly annoying Solanus, approached her and assertively told her to leave immediately, threatening to beat the hell out of her. As this exchange was taking place, the phone rang and Warhol answered. A heated Morrissey stepped into the bathroom, and a frenzied Solanus could take no more rejection. Feeling Warhol had in fact stolen her play and not misplaced it, that Warhol was conspiring against her with the publisher of the Olympia Press. In a fit of white-hot rage, she pulled the 32 caliber Beretta from her bag and began firing wildly at Warhol and Amaya. Her first two shots missed. Andy screamed, No, no, Valerie, don't do it! She fires a second time, again missing. Warhol dropped to the floor to crawl under a desk. She fires a third time, making devastating contact with his torso. The bullet enters Andy's right side and goes straight through him, coming out the left side of his back. The bullet ripped through both lungs, his spleen, stomach, liver, intestines, and esophagus. Warhol laid crumpled on the floor of the factory, his clothing quickly turning crimson red, screaming until he lost consciousness. Thinking that she'd killed Warhol, Solanus turns to Mario Amaya, who is crouching on the floor, and fires a fourth shot at him, missing. She steps closer and pulls the trigger again, hitting him slightly above the hip. The bullet goes right through him without damaging any organs, exiting from his back. Amaya jumps up and runs into the back room, using the weight of his bleeding body to hold the doors shut. Solanus headed for the elevator, pressing the button, but having a change of heart, deciding she wasn't done. She was just getting started. She walks up to a stunned Fred Hughes, Warhol's manager, pointing the still-smoking gun at point-blank range to his head and squeezed the trigger. It was Hughes's lucky day. Nothing happened. The Beretta jammed. No worries. She had a backup, a 22 caliber pistol in her bag that she reached for just as the elevator arrived with a ding. Morrissey staggered out of the bathroom to see Solanus quickly stuffing the gun in her bag and rushing into the elevator just as the doors closed. Amaya and Warhol lay injured on the ground. Warhol was nearing death in a pool of blood. As police arrived, they discovered a paper sack Solanus inadvertently left behind on a table containing her address book. As if this evidence was even needed, Solanus was quickly identified as the shooter. The ambulance takes away both Warhol and the wounded Mario Amaya. In typical overpriced ambulance notoriety, the driver tells Amaya they'll have to pay an extra five bucks if they sound the siren. Amaya agrees. Upon arrival, Andy Warhol is pronounced clinically dead. The doctors clamber to cut open his chest and massage his heart. They're amazed by the damage caused by the single bullet ricocheting through his internal organs before exiting his left side, leaving an enormous hole. He is dead for one and a half minutes before they revive him. They operate for five and a half hours, removing his spleen. He's left in a critical state, but survives. Amaya received only minor injuries and was released from the hospital later the same day. The day after the shoot-up at the factory, Valerie Solanus approached a traffic cop, telling him that she had shot Warhol and handed over the guns to the cop. Confessing that she had done it because Warhol had too much control of my life, she was arrested and sent to Bellevue Hospital for psychiatric examination. Her bail was set at $10,000. She was subsequently diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, and after pleading guilty to reckless assault with intent to harm, she served a three-year prison sentence, including treatment in a psychiatric hospital. 
The shooting brought Solanus the attention she craved. Although mainstream feminist organizations, including the National Organization for Women, distanced themselves and disavowed her agenda, SCUM, the Society for Cutting Up Men, would never get off the ground. Fellas, you may now breathe a sigh of relief. Warhol, meanwhile, spent two months in the hospital recuperating from surgeries to repair his damaged organs, and in some ways he never fully recovered. His injuries were so severe that he had to wear a surgical corset for the rest of his life, a tight wrap to keep his organs in place, left scarred not only physically, scars zigzagging his disfigured torso, but also emotionally. The mental anguish lingered. Warhol said after the shooting, he felt everything was like a dream, that he was saddened because he didn't even know whether or not he was really alive or whether he died. The shooting ended the security-free communal existence of the factory. Within just a couple of years of his recovery, Warhol would be working largely on celebrity portraits and commanding millions of dollars in fees, leaving his scrappy art collective days behind him. His experience left him mortified of hospitals. When he was diagnosed with a gallstone five years later in 1973, he refused surgery after being convinced if he was hospitalized he would die. Unable to put off treatment after his gallbladder became infected, he finally underwent surgery in February 1987. He died the next day of a heart attack at age 58. The shooting 19 years earlier that changed his life eventually took his life. In 1988, at the age of 52, Valerie Solanus died of pneumonia in her room at the Bristol Hotel in the Tenderloin District of San Francisco, where she resided. A building superintendent at the hotel said of Solanus that not long before she was found dead, he had gone into her room to fix a leaking pipe and saw her typing away at her desk. There was a stack of typewritten pages beside her. What she was writing and the whereabouts of the manuscript still remain a mystery. Her mother burned everything Solanus had in life posthumously. Solanus's notorious play was rediscovered in 1999 and produced in 2000 by American theater director George Coates in San Francisco. The copy Warhol had lost was later found in a trunk of lighting equipment in the factory. Coates learned about the rediscovered manuscript while at an exhibition at the Andy Warhol Museum, marking the 30th anniversary of the shooting. Coates turned the piece into a musical, with an all-female cast consulting with Solanus's sister, Judith, while writing the piece. He sought to create a humorous satirist out of Solanus, not just showing her as Warhol's troubled, attempted assassin. And there you have it, the true story of Andy Warhol's brush with death. Now, doesn't that sentence seem a little too lenient? Three years for trying to kill two people? One of them the king of pop and only charged with reckless assault with intent to harm? I suspect today's criminal justice system would tack on a few more years than that. Okay, a little pop trivia for you. In late 69, as Andy Warhol continued to adjust to the drama of the year before, he and a partner started the long-running magazine Interview. With the factory no longer what it was up until the shooting, it was a way for Andy to keep his tenure as the fabulous host he came to be revered as, conducting interviews with celebrities, artists, musicians, and creative thinkers. Articles were printed in the eccentric fashion you would expect of Warhol, or left entirely unedited. Interview, the magazine, ran monthly in print through 2018 for nearly 50 years, and it's now an online magazine with over 600 editions. Perhaps we can keep the serial talker going that long, but we can't do it without your help. So please subscribe to this weekly podcast and if you would like to help support the costs of the production, you could always buy me a cup of coffee 
That helps pay for our web hosting and the hosting for the podcast and keeps me awake for recording and editing these podcasts. Thank you so much. Those details are in the description of this podcast. If you have a compelling true story that you would like me to consider reading, please send it on. Those details are also in the description. And finally, if you have a friend or two you think would like the podcast, by all means, pass it on to them. Much appreciated. Thanks, guys. We'll see you again next week. Ciao for now.